A 25-year-old man presented to the emergency department. He's doubled over in pain and talking in really short sentences. He's prioritised, bloods are taken, and he's given intravenous analgesia. Bowel sounds are all normal, and apart from a centre-right area that's moderately painful on palpation, everything else seems normal in his clinical examination. The pain came on slowly, first umbilical, and then migrating slowly to the lower right abdomen over the next few days. He provides a urine sample, which shows a small number of erythrocytes, but is otherwise unremarkable. Broad spectrum antibiotics are discussed, but they're not given at this point. His bowel and urine habits are unchanged, and he isn't nauseous or vomiting. When asked about his medical history, he doesn't take any regular medications apart from injecting testosterone. Anabolic steroid use is common in this population, and it is discussed even at the senior review, but it isn't thought relevant to whatever's going on with this presentation. An abdominal CT scan is ordered as a priority, but then his bloods come back and everything's normal, a whole abdominal screen. He has a slightly raised CRP, but that's about it. The analgesia is effective, and so this man's priority is lowered, meaning that the CT has been pushed back. After all, A&E is busy all day, every day, and there's always someone in more desperate need of a diagnosis. An hour or two later, the pain comes back. The man is howling in pain, and he says that it's cramping in nature. IV morphine is once again given, and another venous gas is taken. It's now showing a different picture. He's in a rapidly decompensating lactic acidosis. He's rushed for a CT with contrast to investigate either an ischemic bowel or a probable appendicitis. The diagnosis is obvious before it's even reported. There is a unilateral, unperfused area with free fluid. But it isn't in his bowel. It's just above his uterus. He has a necrosing ovarian torsion. The patient had a previous bad experience with his GP and as a result has never again outed himself as a trans man to any healthcare worker. If he was asked directly and told it was relevant, he may have said something to his clinician, but he wasn't and he didn't. Now, not only has a potentially pregnant person been exposed to ionizing radiation without any form of risk assessment or consent, but a potentially life-threatening surgical emergency has been missed despite the clinicians throwing seemingly every test in the book at it. This is an extreme example, but lapses and misdiagnoses like this do happen, and the emergency department is where a lot of diagnoses are made. So what do we need to do differently, and what happens next? Hi, my name's Cass, I'm a registered nurse working in this A&E. This is the second video in a series dedicated to increasing the confidence and the cultural competence of healthcare workers working with trans people. If you're not in healthcare, you are by all means welcome to watch this video, but just know that we are going to wade into the reeds with some medical jargon. I love my job. In emergency medicine, we are great at really dialing in and working out what's relevant, what's not, and what needs to happen next for our patients. We need to be good at this, because at any one time we have anywhere from dozens to hundreds of undifferentiated patients presenting with things from superficial injuries to critically unwell sepsis or major trauma. However, for some reason, this seems to fall apart whenever we're faced with a trans patient. So, let's take one of those patients and we'll follow them step by step through the emergency department and see what we can learn. Let's start with arrival. In the UK, it's supposed to be easy for an adult to change their name with their GP. There are a few barriers to this for trans people that are too nuanced to go into here, but it's important to know that someone may not have changed their name with their GP, despite going by a different name in most areas of their life. Most modern A&Es just book in their patients with the patient record directly from their GP. How you compensate for this depends on how your department works. For example, in my department, various technical and legal factors mean that we can't change a patient's name on our system. But what we can do is we can add their preferred name in quotation marks in the box for their middle name. This is important, not only because it's mortifying to shout out an obviously mismatching name in a busy waiting room, but also because trans people understandably have an attachment to their chosen name. If you choose to ignore it and use the name on their patient record and the assumed pronouns that come with it, then your relationship has broken down before you've even introduced yourself. Let's move on to assessment. So how do you know that someone is trans? You may think you're pretty good at telling, but the truth is that you're not. I'm not, nobody is. For every trans person you've knowingly met or looked after, there has been at least one who you had no idea about. I myself have worked in the department for years and had various colleagues tell me they didn't realise I was trans until I told them I was making this video series and why I was making it. Assuming that this information doesn't apply to you and that you know better is the kind of medical assumption that causes irreversible patient harm. Instead, 
I'm going to repeat a maxim that you hear all the time in emergency medicine. Treat your patient. If they disclose to you that they take hormones as part of your initial assessment, consider whether it's actually relevant before probing why. If you need to expose someone's chest to take an ECG and they seem reluctant, talk it through with them, listening empathetically. Would you order a different test if you knew that the woman in front of you had a prostate but no uterus or ovaries? Well, maybe you should clarify then. At least 1% of the public are trans. It's quite possible in a medium to large a &E, that at least one trans person is booked in at any one time. You could be looking after them and you may not even know it. Someone once said to me, if you treat all of your patients as individuals, as you have to for trans people, you will provide better care for everyone. This individual approach applies to investigation and diagnosis too. There's no reason to get bogged down in a person's trans status. If you're assessing a woman who doesn't have an internal reproductive system, then does it actually matter whether that's congenital, whether she's had them removed through a hysterectomy, or whether she was not born with them because she's trans? All that you know is that it's not a reproductive system problem. This leads us to something called transgender broken arm syndrome. This isn't something that affects trans people, it affects us as clinicians. Trans people regularly report unnecessary or unusual experiences with healthcare that, while shocking, happen every day. The classic example is a trans masculine patient turning up to A&E with a broken arm. The clinicians spend ages wondering if the testosterone therapy has maybe caused an early osteoporosis. Of course, the actual reason is the bike that the man fell off. He probably has the same hormone profile as any other man of his age. All the clinicians are doing is stigmatizing and over-medicalizing an otherwise uncomplicated patient. Similarly, and this is a real story, a trans person was refused antibiotics for a clearly infected wound because the prescribing clinician wanted to hear from a specialist beforehand out of worry that antibiotics may somehow interact with the hormones that the person was taking. Trans people take the exact same hormones that cis people on hormone replacement therapy take. It's not magic, and you rarely need so-called specialist input in uncomplicated cases. Now, there are some isolated cases where a different approach might be required. For example, anyone assigned female at birth who hasn't had a hysterectomy could potentially become pregnant. This is why the Society of Radiographers recommends asking all patients whether they could be pregnant. The rationale being that it's much easier to explain to a confused cisgender man why you're asking if he could be pregnant than to accidentally expose someone who is in fact pregnant to ionizing radiation without ever asking or even considering. Unfortunately, this principle is rarely followed in practice. Other specific variations include so-called lower, bottom or genital surgeries. It's important to know, for example, that in transmasculine people who have had this kind of surgery, that their urethra may not be where you expect it to be. It could be at the tip of the penis, or it could be at the base. Likewise, in trans feminine patients who have had a vaginoplasty, the prostate is almost always located anterior to the vagina, rather than the rectum, where you would expect. If your department is anything like mine, then openly trans, non-binary, or questioning under 18s present every day. Like we discussed last episode, these kids are rarely on puberty blockers, and will never be on hormones, unless they've sourced them from outside mainstream NHS healthcare. What this means is that you can treat them, for most purposes, just as their birth sex. However, what's critical to remember is that's for medical purposes only. When referring to them, or speaking about them, you should use the name and the pronouns that they tell you to use. No ifs and no buts. It really is that simple. As I'm sure you'll agree, talking about this subject at such a surface level raises so many more questions. We could talk for hours, but the last thing that I want to talk to you about is how we communicate with each other and how we hand over information about our trans patients. You do not need to out every trans patient. Sometimes it may be relevant. For example, if you made a urology referral, it may be relevant to put that the woman you've referred has testes and you haven't clicked on the wrong patient by accident. In cases like this, you must obtain patient consent wherever possible. Sharing irrelevant personal information often breaches professional codes of practice. And furthermore, trans people are covered by both the Gender Recognition Act and the Equality Act, meaning that any of these breaches may actually be a breach of law. So, whenever you're sharing a person's trans status, relevance and consent is fundamental. This includes nursing handovers and even GP discharge letters. When discussions take place, use deliberate and specific language. The pronouns that someone uses, like he, she, or they, are not preferred or optional. They are the person's pronouns. You use them. Anything else betrays a lack of patient-centered care, 
and risk contributing to the casual transphobia that is unfortunately endemic within the NHS. Oh, and to clear up the most common question in this topic with the most obvious answer, trans people should be accommodated where they say they want to be accommodated when they're admitted to hospital. You can offer a side room. A lot of trans people will prefer a side room just because of their safety or their comfort. But you have to make it clear to them that for reasons including infection prevention and control or maybe end of life care, they may have to be moved to a shared bay at some point. Trans people do not need to be hidden away just by virtue of being trans and they certainly shouldn't be allocated to a single sex bay that aligns with their sex assigned at birth just because of whatever medical interventions they have or haven't had. Changing our attitudes and our practice is hard, I know. But as emergency department staff, we are involved with our patient at some of the toughest moments of their lives. The trust that we need to get them through that is earned. Trans patients will often, with good reason, be less trusting than most. You owe it to them, to us, to make the effort to bridge that gap. Thank you so much for watching.